you know, the protein thing just won't go away. It is, and the deficiency issue won't go away. It's, it's sort of tied to a bigger issue, which is people think we're deficient in everything, which is why people take so many dietary supplements. Furthermore, the idea is if a little bit of something is a good idea, lots of it has got to be better, right? So if, you, if this much calcium in food is good for you, 20 times as much. All right, well, I think that the misunderstandings about protein go back to when it was discovered. It was really the first nutrient isolated from food. And so if you don't know there are hundreds of thousands of others, you might think that your discovery is a little more important. <laughs> but from the beginning, protein was overemphasized in its importance. And it's very interesting because if you track through medical history, which I'm a fan of medical history and kind of a, it's a hobby of mine to read it, you have these dual tracks. You have to eat protein, more protein is good, you can't get enough of the stuff. And then right along parallel is research study after research study after research study showing that eating so much protein is not such a good idea. Well, the dueling narrative, the high protein folks won. But really, human protein needs are very, very low. And in fact, as little as 2.5% of calories for adults which means that it's impossible, mathematically impossible, to eat a diet that provides enough calories every day that does not provide enough protein. So if you were to live on the lowest protein foods you can possibly eat, which would be foods like rice or potatoes, which have eight or 9% of calories from protein, you'd have enough protein. Okay, you don't need any more than that. I'm not suggesting, of course, that you do that, but the point is that no matter what you eat, if it's enough calories every day, you will eat enough protein. Now, part of the misunderstanding about protein is a, it really is tied to misunderstandings about how the body uses f uh, food for fuel and other nutrients. So, so I always give a, an analogy that I learned from a good friend of mine, Dr. Janice Stanger, and I think it explains it so well. So when you eat carbohydrate from food, it's like gasoline in the car. So I fill my tank with gas, I drive until the gas is used up and I have to go get more gas. When you eat carbohydrate foods, you use the carbohydrate in the form of glucose for energy, and when you run out, you have to eat some more food. It's quite different with protein. Protein is like the fountain full of 500 gallons of water in the downtown square. All right, so when you eat protein, um, the amino acids are broken down, proteins broken down into peptides and polypeptides and amino acids. And those amino acids circulate around through the body and they're used to form hormones and enzymes and, and uh, various substances that the body needs for function, all right? Um, after an enzyme's used, the amino acids are broken apart and then they can be circulated again. So it's sort of like the downtown fountain. You've got 500 gallons of water and every day they don't go out and add 500 new gallons. You just replace the gallons of water that have been um, splashed out or evaporated. So maybe it's 20. And that's the way it is with protein. The only thing that you're going to replace is those amino acids that eventually get used up enough times that they're torched and they can't be used again. And how do we know that? Well, when the amino acids go out of circulation or they're converted to something else, for example, to use as fuel, um, they release nitrogen. And um, you can track nitrogen excretion through urinary uh, tests and that sort of thing. So, so that's, that's the difference. And I think the misunderstanding is that somehow the protein gets used up the way that the carbohydrate gets used up and it's really not the same thing. Now, having said that, uh, what happens if you consume too much protein uh, and it, of any type? Well, if, it's, if you consume too much animal protein, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer a lot. If you consume too much protein from any source, the problem with the nitrogen that gets released is it also throws off tox toxic byproducts like urea and um, ammonia. Your kidneys get charged with dis excreting those toxic byproducts, and so eventually, you can blow out your kidneys with high protein intake. So it's a dangerous practice in many, many ways. Um, it's interesting that you ask about protein and muscle. I'm teaching a class on sports nutrition now, and I've been doing an enormous amount of research. Actually, consuming too much protein is counterproductive to building muscle. And the reason is that the body uses carbohydrate for fuel. So if you eat a really high protein diet, you're displacing some calories that you would be taking in from much needed carbohydrate for fuel. 
So what will happen to the person who consumes too much protein is the body will use up the carbohydrate, then it looks for alternative fuel. And some amino acids convert quite readily, like alanine, to, um, uh, to glucose-like substances. And that's what the body will do. And if it can't get enough from dietary protein, it'll start catabolizing um, tissue, muscle tissue in the body. So it's counterproductive even for an athlete to uh, consume so much protein. Um, one other thing I'll say about this, and, and that is that somehow people got the idea that you can build muscle in the kitchen. Okay, you know where you build muscle? in the gym. <laughs> That's where you have to go. It's resistance training. And we have some really good studies that have shown if you take a group of people and put them in, say, 12 weeks of an exercise program, and they're all going to do the identical strength training and exercise. And then you feed them varying amounts of protein. So you give this group 17% of calories and protein, and this group gets 35% of calories and protein. At the end of the 12 weeks, you have identical um, uh, advancement in terms of the building of muscle tissue, burning of fat, and the reason is it didn't have anything to do with the protein, it had to do with the training, okay? One last thing I'll mention is that recovery is very important. So if you're a professional athlete, the more you can work out, the better you're going to get. I mean, we all know that more practice means more skill, right? Okay, so if you can recover faster and work out three times a day instead of two, or two harder workouts instead of two slightly less hard workouts, you're going to be a better trained athlete, you're going to be more competitive. Well, here's my point. Um, after working out hard, what you want to do is replace your glycogen stores. You can only do that with carbohydrate. All right, so the person who is loading up on protein is at a disadvantage in terms of recovery to work out more. Um, as opposed to the person who's consuming more of a carbohydrate-based diet. The best recovery food is carbohydrate. Now, you're going to eat some protein, I mean, because all foods have protein, but, but you don't need to go out of your way to eat, to drink protein smoothies and protein bars, and, 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 but that's the way things are advertised. Notice how many commercials you see on TV for food bars or um, smoothie mixes and that sort of thing, and it take, contains 14 grams of protein. It might contain only garbage in addition to that, but contains 14 grams of protein. So people think you got to load up on protein every meal before you work out, during the workout, after workout. Really bad idea. And one of the things that you see is that athletes who engage in this kind of behavior um, youth will protect you against a lot of things. So an athlete who's 25 and, and uh, loading up on protein and eating a lot of animal food in order to do it often is protected by age. But as that person uh, begins to get older, you know, first of all, um, the age doesn't protect you anymore, so you start to suffer from the consequences of your poor eating habits. And often careers are ended earlier than they need to uh, because athletes don't feed themselves properly. There are a lot of differences between animal protein and plant-based proteins, and one is the amino acid structure of the food, of the, of the, um, of the food itself. And so uh, animal-based proteins contain a lot of sulfur-containing amino acids. And I'll, I'll give you just one example of how that can increase the risk of a specific type of cancer. So take colon cancer, which is one of the leading causes of cancer death in Western countries. Um, the mucosal lining of, of the colon um, is very smooth and uh, irritation causes polyps. In fact, irritation any place where you have a mucosal membrane, like even the sinuses, can cause polyps. Well, irritation causes polyps in the mucosal lining, and the more the irritation, uh, the bigger the polyps get, and at a certain point in time they can become cancerous. Well, where does this irritation come from? Well, it comes from sulfur-containing amino acids, which uh, one of the toxic byproducts um, irritates the lining of the colon. So um, that's quite different than the amino acid chains that make up plant proteins, which have some of these same uh, amino acids, but in much smaller quantity. So there's a big difference between plant protein and animal protein, but as I said earlier, consuming too much of any of it is a bad idea. Well, I have a good friend who speaks at these conferences too, called Will Esselstyn, and he makes a, a comment. I'll try and make it as, as close to his version as possible, but he says all the time, um, cardiovascular disease need never exist, and if it exists, it need never progress. In other words, there are places on the planet where you still see populations that have virtually no cardiovascular disease. 
And what they have in common is they eat a low-fat plant-based diet. Animal food's a condiment. They eat it, but it's in very tiny quantities. Here, it's the center of the plate. So the bottom line is that it's a, it's a diet and lifestyle-induced disease. We could get rid of it if we, if we chose to. And doing so would be a good idea, first of all, because it kills 44% of the population. People would live their full lifespan in many cases. And the second thing is it costs so much money. I mean, we spend probably 20% um, of the healthcare budget in this country is spent on a disease that absolutely doesn't even need to exist. You know, genetics play a role in everything. You know, it's why I have, well, we don't know what color my hair is. We won't. <laughs> At my age, you don't want to know. But it's why I have brown eyes and somebody else has blue eyes and somebody's blonde or you know, the genetics plays a role. And, and some genes you can't do much about. The brown eyes genes, not, not so much negotiation that you can have there. Um, genes do predispose people to disease, but this is a much more negotiable contract than the genes that dictate brown eyes and being five feet seven inches tall. And so um, two things to say about genes. The first thing is that you can switch on a genetic predisposition by misbehaving. So autoimmune diseases, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, run in my family. All women on my mother's side of the family had rheumatoid arthritis by the time they were in their 50s. I don't. Well, the reason is that I don't engage in the types of behaviors that cause that disease to onset and progress. I, I could make myself have, I'm sure if I started behaving badly, I could get, develop rheumatoid arthritis in a fairly short period of time, but I don't. So the, you have a choice. It's a predisposition. It's not a sentence. And that is a very important distinction for people because none of us get to choose our genes. So if we really believe that genetic predisposition is going to determine our health outcomes, Gosh, we're all helpless victims, but if you believe that and you understand that it's really up to you, uh, then you have a lot more power over your health outcomes. The other side of it is that I've seen fam people and families, no genetic predisposition at all for a disease, but there's so much misbehavior that they can actually override their good genetic profile and end up overweight and sick. So it works both ways. You can have a strong genetic predisposition and overcome it, uh, by behaving badly, eating terrible foods, not exercising, gaining weight, and end up with the family disease. Um, or you can, you can do the same thing. You can override your good genetic predisposition by behaving badly. I should probably say that differently. I'm going to say that again. So this works both ways. A person with a, with a genetic predisposition can override that by doing the right things. And a person who has a great genetic predisposition can override that by misbehaving. So really it's up to you what to do about that. Well, the main contributors to stroke, it's, it's the same thing as cardiovascular disease. People eat a lot of cholesterol and fat. Um, their blood becomes viscous and sticky. They develop plaques inside the arteries. The arteries start to constrict. Um, the stroke is a blood clot and the vessels that go to the brain or in, in the interior of the brain. Again, completely preventable. And, and stroke, I mean, both stroke and heart attack can result in instant death. Um, but many people recover much more nicely from a heart attack than they do from a stroke. Stroke can cause permanent disability. And, and one thing I want to say about this, and I think it's important, when you have a stroke or when something fairly cataclysmic happens to you from a health perspective that impairs your ability to function, this isn't just about you. It's about the burden that gets thrust upon your family and your friends, and um, that happened to me. You know, my mother spent the last 15 years of her life being sick because she wouldn't take care of herself, and um, it not only impacted her, her quality of life was terrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I watched my father become increasingly exhausted from the, the, just the emotional ordeal and the logistics of her in and out of hospitals and operations and rehab in a nursing home. And, and my sister, who was far more involved in it than I was. Um, and, and so everybody suffers. So I always tell people, you know, one of the most unselfish things that you can do is to be selfish enough to take good care of yourself take the time to take good care of yourself so that you don't end up becoming a burden on the people who you love.
Yeah, diet and lifestyle and some environmental factors. And, and I would say cigarette smoking is an environmental factor. Um, for, that's a big one, for example. But, but it's primarily diet and lifestyle. There, is, there are some instances where um, cancer develops and, and we really don't have an explanation and, and time, people who really have been dealt a poor genetic hand. But the vast major, majority of the time, it's, it's diet and lifestyle. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. We have very specific mechanisms of action in, in all of these things. Um, one is that people consume dairy products. Well, dairy products come from uh, pregnant and lactating cows or other animals, sheep, goats, whatever. Um, well, these products contain estrogen as a result. So most breast cancers, for example, are estrogen receptor positive. So consuming estrogen and estrogen metabolites in food is definitely counterproductive if you don't want to get breast cancer, all right? Um, it has a different type of effect on men, but the risk that a man who eats dairy products will develop prostate cancer is higher than the risk that a smoker will develop lung cancer. This is pretty strong stuff, you know? Another thing is that people overeat and they gain weight. They become overweight or obese. Um, Fat cells produce inflammatory cytokines, which raises the general inflammation level in the body. And inflammation is a factor in every disease that people don't want to get, including cancer. And so uh, this, increase, this type of behavior increases the risk of cancer. But then once you have cancer, it decreases the uh, chance that you will survive or not have a recurrence. And what's so distressing to me is, first of all, watching people the way they eat, the way they take care of themselves, they don't exercise, et cetera, they don't drink enough water. So you watch people engage in what is essentially self-destructive behavior, whether they realize it or not, and end up getting cancer, and that's tragic. But then they often get treatment for cancer and go back to doing those very same things, which is almost a guarantee that at some point in time, either a recurrence of cancer is going to happen or some other dreadful thing. You know, those, the same habits that lead to cancer also lead to heart disease and autoimmune diseases and arthritis and many, many other conditions that people don't want to get. You know, everybody thinks that milk builds strong bones. There's good reason for that because the dairy industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars over a very long time <laughs> convincing us that it's true. But actually, dairy doesn't build strong bones, and we have a number of studies showing that the more milk you drink, the more fractures you get, the more dairy products you consume. It doesn't matter if you consume it in the form of milk or cheese or butter or whatever you're eating it in, um, it still leads to fracture risk. And that in countries where dairy products aren't consumed and calcium intake is significantly lower, you see a much lower risk of osteoporosis and fractures. So that sounds counterintuitive, but one of the reasons is that um, one of the things, there are many things that build strong bones. Exercise is one of them. Having a good functioning gastrointestinal tract so you're absorbing nutrients from food. Sunlight so you produce vitamin D. So lots of things that contribute to strong bones, but one of them is uh, not putting demands on your body in, or in order to maintain um, a blood pH that's in a, a safe range, okay? So when people eat a lot of what we call high acid load foods, like eggs and meat and dairy, um, if you're living on that kind of stuff, your body has to work very, very hard to make sure that your blood pH doesn't drop below 7.35, because if you stay there for very long, you won't be alive. So what the body will do is borrow buffering chemicals, uh, substances rather, from the bones, like calcium, uh, Calcium is a known buffer, and, um, and you do enough of that, and you will start to demineralize your bones uh, just in an attempt to stay alive. So the best thing to do if you want strong bones is not to eat dairy. It's to eat optimally, eating a low-fat, plant-based diet. Get out in the sunshine and, um, and uh, exercise. Uh, multiple sclerosis and all autoimmune diseases are, have a very strong dietary component. And in the case of multiple sclerosis, it appears that saturated fat and dairy are both um, precursors, strong precursors to the development of multiple sclerosis, particularly in genetically susceptible people. Um, the reason why saturated fat plays such a great role is that the same type, the same mechanism that causes injury to the vessels, the blood vessels in the body, causes injury to the myelin. Uh, that, um, that coats the nerves. 
And uh, it's another very preventable disease. I mean, we have you know, half a million people in the United States that have it right now. Average cost for drug treatment, which doesn't help at all, is about $56,000 a year. And uh, it, it's, a, it's one of those diseases like stroke where you have the potential to become completely disabled and a burden on your family. So completely preventable. And in many cases, particularly at early stages, can be arrested with a good diet. So, so many diseases uh, are a result of damage to our gut microbiome, which we don't talk about often enough, but I'm incredibly fascinated with, all right? So, in your, in your gut, you have 100 trillion bacteria. A healthy person does anyway. Now, to put that in perspective, you have only 37 trillion cells in your whole body. So, there's more of them than there are of us. They're really not part of the body. They're like renters. They're renting space from us. All right, so what these little critters do down there is several, several functions that are important. They help us absorb nutrients from food. Um, they keep things out of the bloodstream that shouldn't be getting in. And they also are a signaling system for our immune system. So when these critters get destroyed, uh, many bad things can happen, including immune dysregulation. And so how do we uh, end up with destroyed gut microbiomes? Well, one of them is antibiotics. And we're increasingly using broad spectrum antibiotics, which wipe out all the bacteria. They're not selective for the pathogen that's causing your infection. They wipe out all the bacteria, including the gut bacteria, which makes a person much more susceptible to a number of things, including anything that involves dysregulation of the immune system. And conditions that involve dysregulation of the immune system are asthma, allergies, autoimmune disease, or um, the other side of that, those are um, conditions where the immune system is misbehaving in an overactive way conditions where people are having uh, that involve the immune system behaving in an underactive way would be serial infections. You know, the person who says, I have six or seven sinus infections a year, that's your, your immune system just not able to mount a response. Or cancer, profound failure of the immune system. So that's the relationship. Now, why would dairy come into play in what I just said? Well, here's the thing. Dairy products, particularly in children, tend to um, cause ear infections. That's almost become a rite of passage for kids. They start getting ear infections. Well, what do we give to kids with ear infections? Antibiotics. The antibiotics wipe out the gut bacteria, which makes it likely that the child will get another ear infection, which causes more antibiotics. And you have this vicious cycle where the child gets sick again and again until one fine day the pediatrician says we probably should put tubes in those ears. Uh, because of the chronic infections, totally unnecessary. And we have some research that shows that for kids who have serial ear infections, that if you just take them off the dairy, if you don't do anything else but take them off the dairy, they get better and often don't need the tubes. But if you take them off the dairy, put them on a health-promoting diet, and give them probiotics to restore that gut bacteria, they get all the way better. We have to be careful that we're using the science in the right way. Uh, we aren't always using science in the right way because everybody goes to reductionism, you know. And, and a good example of how things get misconstrued is that we know that the gut bacteria, the composition of the gut bacteria in an obese person is different than in a normal weight person. And we also know the reason for it because it, how the, bac the bacterial composition depends upon what you eat because you can preferentially feed pathogens or you can preferentially feed the um, positive, the healthy bacteria. Well, you have a whole contingent of people out there that are saying, gosh, maybe if we gave probiotics to overweight people, they'd lose weight. Always going to the simplest thing that involves no work on behalf of the human. Gosh, if we could fix all the overweight people in the country with probiotics, wouldn't that be fabulous? You and I would buy stock in a probiotic company for sure. But um, it's just not that simple. And so we have to be, we have to be grateful for the research and, and diagnostic technology we have. And, all the scientific discoveries, but we have to make sure that we use them in the right way. Another thing I should add about the antibiotic issue is that when people think about taking antibiotics, they think about going to the doctor, being diagnosed with an infection, or claiming to have one. Sometimes there's not much in the way of diagnostics, it's just here, it's an antibiotic. Um, and then going home and taking the pills. But there's another way in which people take in a lot of antibiotics, and they don't really realize it. Um, and I have people, by the way, who will say, I have never had an antibiotic prescription, and I can assure them that they probably have been taking antibiotics for years, and that is the antibiotic found in the food. 
you know, for a very long time, the FDA ignored this and, and even made statements about that this didn't impact human health. But the reality is that we think about 75% of all the antibiotics made in the United States are given to farm animals in their feed. And the reason it's done, it has a twofold purpose. One is to prevent infection. Uh, because these animals are living in such close confinement that if you have one infected chicken and there are 10,000 in the building, you, you can't kill off all the chickens. The other thing is this discovery was made in the 1940s, believe it or not, and that is that giving animals, fish, whatever, antibiotics causes them to uh, grow bigger and faster. So um, right now the average chicken gets to, goes to slaughter in 40 days instead of 10 weeks, and it's in part due to the antibiotic in the food. Well, this antibiotic residue is left in the food um, that we eat. It's in the chicken breast. And, um, and what the, there's, there are upper limits, by the way, on how much of an antibiotic can be in the food. So how the farmers get around all of this is they buy these big bags of antibiotic at the farm store. And they don't need a prescription for this, by the way. Anybody can go in and get it. And it, the, the bag is filled with lots of different types of antibiotics so that you don't hit the upper limit on tetracycline or amoxicillin. But, but the overall amount of antibiotic in the food is significant. And it's one of the leading causes of antibiotic resistant infection in our country right now. So it's very scary. Um, we're starting to see people who develop infectious diseases that antibiotics can't help. And there really aren't any on the horizon that um, in the development stage that can solve that problem. So the only way we can really address this is twofold. Um, doctors need to prescribe less antibiotics. Patients need to stop asking for so many antibiotics because the doctors are sometimes in an uncomfortable position where patients are saying, I have an infection, you better give me an antibiotic. And then we've got to stop purchasing food that contains antibiotic, which means that if you're going to consume animal foods safely, you have to, uh, have to buy organic uh, animal foods. Um, it's going to be hard to get farmers to stop doing it because, uh, unless you pass a law, which isn't going to happen, because they make so much money getting a chicken to the amount of food you save and everything else, getting a chicken to slaughter in 40 days instead of 10 weeks, that they're never going to voluntarily give this up. So consumers really have to stop buying it. You know, medical treatment is the third leading cause of death, third right now. And that only accounts for medical treatment in hospitals. If you moved it to outpatient treatment as well, God only knows what it would be. Higher, I'm sure. So how can this possibly be? Well, when we talk about death from medical treatment, we have to be fair about this and say that um, a lot of people die in the hospital because they're awfully sick when they get there with diseases that were lifestyle induced. My mother died in a hospital and she died from two things, self-neglect and drinking the medical Kool-Aid, thinking that the things that they were doing to her were going to help and they didn't. My mother died at 78 and she comes from a family of people who live way into old age, so quite prematurely. Um, so anyway, um, so some of this is, is not really the fault of the medical system, but I'll tell you the part that is the fault of the medical system. Um, there's medical error. Uh, one thing that we tell everybody is if you or a family member is in the hospital, you need advocates. If you're going to be there for any long period of time or even overnight, you can have an advocate. If you're going to be there for a couple of weeks, you're going to need a few of them to rotate so that you can keep track of medications and things of this nature because mistakes happen, some of them fatal. Um, another one is that medical treatment is often given instead of diet and lifestyle advice. And all medical intervention has some side effect. There are no drugs. If, if, if a drug has a positive effect, there's going to be a corresponding side effect because you can't uh, manipulate one enzyme system in the body without having others be impacted too. That's just the way it works. So when we give people drugs or when we perform procedures, there are always risks associated with procedures, um, and we don't tell people that there's a better way to heal up their health, we often induce more health issues. In fact, I'm sure you've met people where it's very difficult to determine is this person suffering from a disease or is this person more suffering from the treatment that has been given for the disease with all the procedures and drugs and all that sort of thing. So um, our quality of medical treatment, we do a lot of quantity of medical treatment in this country, but the quality of it is not so good. And one of the biggest reasons is that it's, um, it's symptom control rather than addressing the cause. 
and thus people get worse instead of better. And sometimes they get worse while they feel better, and that's, that can be very deceptive to somebody. You know, the research is very confusing, and one of the reasons is that there's the perception that all research is created equal, and if it's in a medical journal, it must be correct. But there are so many ways in which you can manipulate research, and, and one of them is study design. And we see this all the time. So um, if you have a bad study design, it, it, you can set it up exactly to prove your point. Let me give you an example. Um, I am aware of a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that said eating lower fat diet doesn't really make any difference. Well, if the people eating the high fat diet are eating 39% of calories from fat, and the people eating the low fat diet are eating 36% of calories from fat, you're not gonna see any difference between the two. But that's like saying that when people get into a car accident driving 90 miles an hour, almost everybody dies. And the same thing is true when they're going 80 miles an hour. Apparently, it doesn't matter how fast you drive, right? Well, we, all, we understand that clearly. It does matter how fast you drive, but you have to have enough of a reduction in speed in order to uh, have a protective effect. And so it is with these types of studies. So um, a lot of industry-sponsored studies are specifically structured so that whatever this industry represents or whatever this group of manufacturers makes will turn out pretty well. And uh, another thing, too, is that you always have to look at how statistically significant the effect is. Because I read some of these studies everybody's all excited about. And so what you see is that in a particular study funded by the fish industry, it appears that people eating fish um, have a one half of 1% lower risk of having a heart attack during the one year that the people were looked at, which really isn't enough time. And, uh, Self-reported data, this is another important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at di um, studies of diet and how they impact health, is that a lot of it is self-reported data, like people will, the researchers will ask, what do you eat? Um, here's the problem, we have very good evidence showing that people lie. And we don't know why this is. We don't know if they're trying to impress the researchers or it's a form of self-delusion, but consistently people will report eating more healthy foods than unhealthy foods. Um, and, uh, and just to give you an example, the NHANES data, if you're to believe that the self-reported data, reported data is true, everybody in the United States is consuming on average fewer calories than it takes to stay alive. Well, <laughs> you can look around and see that is clearly not the case. So you have to look at these studies and what they show and look at their study design and because there are lots of different ways you can come up with what looks like a credible research study and get it published that really doesn't have any validity at all. Well, dairy is a, is a special kind of animal food. You know, it's a, I, I don't necessarily think everybody has to be completely vegan to be healthy, which is in itself a controversial stand to take in some circles. However, the people who are eating animal food around the world and surviving, and not just surviving, but thriving, living long lives like the Okinawans, they eat a teeny tiny bit of this stuff. That's the big issue. So why do I say exempt dairy when it's okay to eat a little bit of organic chicken or beef or wild-caught fish if you want to? Um, it's a special kind of animal food because it, it is designed by its very nature to help a baby mammal of varying types to achieve a certain growth rate in a specific period of time. So let's just look at the difference between, say, humans and cows. Um, cows are born at 90 pounds, and cow's milk is designed to help that animal grow to several hundred pounds within just a few months' time. All right? Humans are born at six to eight pounds, and they take 18 years to reach someplace between 100 and 200 pounds, generally, range, all right? So when you're consuming a product that comes from cows, which has growth promoters designed to grow a ginormous animal in a short period of time, those growth promoters, particularly for adults, can lead to conditions like cancer. Um, but the other thing is that humans and all mammals are weaned eventually, there's usually a pretty specific period of time during which mammals nurse their young, after which they're weaned, and after which they don't consume any mammal's milk from any source. 
um, significant populations on the planet, the Asians, the uh, Latin Americans, Hispanics, uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, African Americans do not digest milk well, uh, for cow's milk and, and milk from other species well. And, um, and so they're at a particular advantage, disadvantage in terms of increased risk of allergies, asthma, cancer, uh, infections, all kinds of things. So um, it's just like I said in a class of itself. And then of course the estrogen content which we talked about earlier, um, which, is, which is a risk factor for conditions like breast cancer. Well, you know, with Crohn's disease, Crohn's and colitis are part of a family of conditions called inflammatory bowel disease, which are autoimmune diseases. They're in the category of autoimmune diseases. And like other autoimmune diseases, they are brought about by, in part, there's a lot more to autoimmune than just diet, but diet has a really um, big connection. And what we see in the studies is that um, the people who are most likely to develop uh, inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's, um, tend to eat a lot of refined and processed foods, a lot of animal food, a lot of fat, a lot of dairy, strong connection with dairy. Um, so if that's what causes it, part of the solution is the opposite. You're going to eat whole foods, you're going to eat more plant foods, you're going to eat lot, a lot of uh, less fat and a lot less animal food. Having said that, this particular population of people um, can't just convert to a plant-based diet like the one that I'm eating today. Um, their systems have become so fragile that good food can sometimes upset them. So we phase in a plant-based diet through several stages which involve some low protein, low fat, actually lower fiber plant foods that allow that gastrointestinal tract to start healing up, lower the inflammation for a while, and then eventually get them to the place where they can eat lots of big salads and raw fruit and that sort of thing. But if a, if a Crohn's patient who's having a lot of bloody bowel movements were to eat what I'm gonna eat today, it'd be very painful. But once we get the gut all healed up, that person can eat what I'm going to eat today and, and would be thriving and, and potentially asymptomatic and not require drug treatment. Well, with hepatitis C, um, the drug treatments aren't very effective. New drug treatments claim to cure the disease, but we have very limited follow-up. And actually, the period of time um, in, in a uh, virus-free state was uh, shortened with these new drugs that were approved. So I'm, I'm not a fan, and I'm also not convinced that we found the cure to hepatitis C. Um, so what we've been able to do with, with a lot of hep C patients, put them on uh, an alcohol-free diet. You can't afford to upset the liver anymore, so this is the time you become a teetotaler. Um, you start drinking enough water, eating an optimal diet, and many times what you see is that um, sometimes the, the virus goes away, sometimes it just stays stable. And many conditions, if you can stabilize them and they don't progress, uh, they won't kill you. And for many people who look at the side effects of the drugs, they decide that um, at least attempting to do this with diet uh, is a good idea. We often use targeted supplements with these people too. Now, one thing that I think occurs to people when we're talking about this is, my gosh, does diet just cure everything? It doesn't cure everything. It cures most things, or at least it contributes to the cure of most things. Um, and people will say, well, can it be this simple? I mean, really, does diet cause all this? I want you to think about this in a little bit different way. You know, the average human puts a ton of food through his body or her body every year, a ton. Now, this room that we're sitting in here, a ton of food wouldn't fit in here. That's how big it is. So it's just impossible for, I think, anybody who's rational to think that you could put a ton of anything through your body and it wouldn't have an effect, good or bad. So we have to look at diet as the foundational thing that is involved in people developing Western diseases because you don't have a lot of obesity and cancer and heart disease and autoimmune diseases in uh, rural uh, China or Northern Africa. You have a lot of it in the United States, Australia, and Norway, countries that are westernized. So diet is a primary cause and I don't think anybody gets well from these kinds of chronic conditions without adopting an optimal diet. So I don't want to overpromise the benefit of diet, but I think too many people underestimate the benefit of diet.
um, big agriculture has the big in, biggest influence over the USDA, and for good reason. If you go back and read the law that was passed and Abraham Lincoln signed into law that created the United States Department of Agriculture, it was set up as an advocacy organization for farmers. And it was for good reason. You know, we, we today tend to forget that it wasn't all that long ago that the United States really had a lot of food insecurity. At the turn of the century, between the 1800s and 1900s, you had the huge swaths of the population who were underfed. And this was a lot because um, farming is hard work and it's sometimes unpredictable. Weather, crop failures, all kinds of things can happen. So the USDA was formed because it was decided that the government, because of food being such an important thing to survival, just couldn't afford for the volatility of circumstance, you know, and, and happenstance uh, to affect our food, um, uh, our food uh, availability. So after the USDA was formed, um, if you looked at the early years, you would have given it a thumbs up uh, because what they were doing was, was working on irrigation, teaching farmers to um, till the soil, not just the top layer, but uh, for a long time farmers would just destroy some acreage and then they'd just go next door and plant some more acreage because we used to have a whole lot of country and, and all, it seemed unlimited at the time that you could do this. Well, you, could, you couldn't do it unlimited. So there was a lot of um, advancement in terms of irrigation and uh, how to till the soil and the proper use of safe fertilizers and that sort of thing. And then things took a dark turn. Where the, connect, where the partnership between farmers and the farming industry and the USDA became a lot more one of influence. And, um, and there's too much of that going on in government. I don't think we should just pick on the farmers and the USDA. And I also think we have to make sure we look at the system promotes the bad behavior. We have to change the system. It's not the people who are doing it. But be that as it may, right now, farmers have a great deal of influence over the USDA. And this is complicating things because the USDA, over 100 years ago, took it upon itself to become involved in the uh, development of guidelines for uh, diets for Americans. Uh, so, you know, all the pyramids and the food plates and all that sort of thing, the USDA is involved in this. And so the USDA is in an intractable position. You can't solve this. If they were ever to tell Americans how to eat, they would have to tell them to eat less of some of the things produced by the farmers, and those are the real constituents that are served by the USDA. So we should get rid of that conflict of interest. And then we should further get rid of the partnerships like the checkoff programs that uh, are administered by the USDA. And I don't know if you know about those, but um, the dairy checkoff program, all the farmers who produce dairy products of any type pay a certain fee per pound. And it goes into a fund, and it's administered by the USDA, and taxpayer dollars are involved in this too to promote things like eating more dairy products. And don't you find this ironic? The federal government is over here promoting the consumption of more dairy products, partnering with fast food restaurants to come up with recipes so we can put cheese in the crust of the pizza and add extra cheese to the sandwiches so we can have more disease, which then the government is charged with helping you know, with Medicaid, Medicare, to resolve the health issues that result from all that increased dairy. And it, so we should just get rid of all of that and go back to the idea that the USDA could help farmers to be better farmers and uh, work on technology and things of that nature. Well, it, the government's job is not to keep people healthy. And, and I think that's another problem too. We keep charging the government with doing more and more things that the government's not supposed to do. If you take a look at the federal government, the federal government is supposed to be involved in things like defense of the country, infrastructure, keeping people safe. Again, I go back to, I read the law that formed the USDA. I don't have any objections to it. I, and if you look at the time in which it was passed, there were a lot of people that benefited because starvation was a problem in our country. So, so the government is supposed to do things that people can't do for themselves. And back in the 1800s when this was done, you had a bunch of family farms. Nobody was using technology and none of these people had enough money to make things better for themselves. And they were so busy growing food that they didn't have time to say, we should take a little bit of every day and go out and explore irrigation, right? So, so that's something the government can do. But when we get the government involved in things like telling people what to eat and how to stay healthy, and I think there are better ways to do it. And, and I'm seeing the government in, in all areas of health um, becoming more and more involved. It's part of the nanny state, which I have an objection to on a number of different levels. But for this discussion, we'll just stick to the ones about health.
You know, one of the saddest things that I've seen is that, uh, and if, I, I don't like to see people take it, being taken advantage of, let me back up and say that. Um, I think a lot of people want to help with this health crisis. And one of the seemingly good ways to do that is to become involved with disease groups. So the American Diabetes Association, um, there are the uh, National Association, uh, they're all, well, I can't remember the name of it, but there are a bunch of them that are involved in mental health. CHAD is one that's involved with people who have attention deficit disorder. Um, so chronic disease, mental health, you have, there's a disease group for almost everything, breast cancer survivors, et cetera. So people get involved in these organizations and they raise money for them and we've got people wearing pink ribbons and racing for the cure and all that sort of thing. The dark side of these organizations is that they're funded by drug and food companies. And what happens is even celebrities become unwitting pawns in the promotion of drugs, food, procedures. Um, and some of the, the perverse relationships that happen, it, this would be fodder for Saturday Night Live if the consequences were not so serious. I remember um, one, for, it was about 18 months uh, of, of period of time uh, when the health tip of the day on the website for the American Diabetes Association was sponsored by Eskimo Pie. Now what kind of a message does that send to diabetics? You should eat more Eskimo pie? It's insane. And so um, these organizations, in my opinion, should be, uh, find some way to be self-supporting without taking so much money from these groups, which clearly has an influence on, on what they say and, and the stances that they take. Um, so, and, and by the way, there are a lot of good people working in these organizations. I, I put it this way. I think what we have is a lot of good apples and bad barrels. Okay, so we've got to change the, the barrel so that the, the good apples can do good work. We've all been part of the machine in one way or another, either by being unwitting participants, you know, being the receiving end, buying the bad food, and, and you know, receiving the ineffective or dangerous medical treatment and that sort of thing. So we've all been part of it. And um, the, the, what we have to do is just massive amounts of education. And the difficulty in some of this, when you look at these nonprofits, is that people become very defensive. It's very difficult for a person to say, I was deceived or taken advantage of. I know I had a lot of those feelings when I first started down this path. Um, we all want to think we're smart and savvy, right? And, and so when you start to understand, I've been lied to, and not only was I lied to, but I behaved in a way that is exactly what they wanted me to do. I used to eat dairy products. I used to eat a lot of things that are advertised on TV. I took a lot of useless supplements, insurance for your health, right? I went to doctors. I took drugs I shouldn't have taken. I, you know, and then you know, even before I was in this profession, there was that sickening feeling in the pit of your stomach. You know, my gosh, was I an idiot? Nobody likes that. And the more involved people have been in these groups, the harder it is. And you have to, I just try to be very, very delicate. Uh, well, I try to be very delicate all the time when I'm dealing with people who are uninitiated. Like the people at this conference, they all came here because they have an idea that things aren't right. They're looking for answers here. But when I'm out with other people and friends, social situations, whatever, I really try to just wait for teachable moments. And, um, and when I get one of those, instead of spewing all of this, you know, I'll sometimes say, I'd be happy to give you some things to read about it, you know, and uh, just really gently so that people don't get so defensive. But I understand the defensiveness because I experienced some of it myself. The pharmaceutical industry has the biggest impact on the FDA, and part of it is the setup. So I think it was in 1992, a law was passed, we call it the PDUFA law, and it allows drug companies to fund the FDA with the idea that drug approvals were taking so long that if drug companies gave money to the FDA, they would have more resources and then drug approvals could be faster. Well, that certainly has happened, but I think this year the estimate uh, for the amount of money that will be paid to the FDA by drug companies is $787 million and change. And if you go back and look at the period of time since this happened, you'll see every year the number percentage of drug applications that are approved, it's now up to about 
Now, people will say, oh, no, that's not true because I know this drug failed, this drug failed to get approval. Well, but they get recycled. So the drug gets, doesn't get approved, and then they submit it again. So if you take a look at the number of applications that actually end up getting approved, it's about 96%. And so I always say to people, tongue in cheek, I want to see the 4% they're turning down, right? It must be like arsenic pills or something of that nature. And there's probably a conversation in the hallway that's something like, you know, we would have done this for you, but we have to look like we're paying attention, so submit it next year, we'll take care of you. So we have, a, we have another extremely flawed system like the uh, USDA situation that's just fraught for all kinds of misbehavior. Um, so FDA approved doesn't mean anything. You better do your own research if somebody prescribes a drug to you to make sure that it's really going to benefit you and it isn't going to hurt you more than it's going to benefit you. Um, in the area of food, um, there's a lot less um, regulation than people might imagine. Um, the food companies aren't paying the FDA. Um, and the FDA, the FTC is more involved in um, advertising foods, making sure that the claims that are, that are made um, are, are correct or not incorrect. The FDA is involved in the silly health claims that are made about food. And so this is something we should just do away with. We spend a fortune on this kind of stuff and regulating it, and it ends up being ridiculous. So uh, I'll give you an example. There's a, a chocolate product, a chocolate chewy product, that's fortified with calcium and vitamin D, and it's good for your bones. All right? The FDA allows that claim. Now, I've got to tell you something. There's nobody in this city right now who would like to see chocolate build strong bones than this woman here. I, I have never lost my love for chocolate, and I can't have it in my house because I would eat it, but believe me, I do love chocolate. Okay, if only it were true. But people buy this stuff. One of the reasons why companies go out, food companies go out of their way to, to get these types of claims approved, and the supplement companies are very involved in this too, is because they know that if you can put a health claim on the front package of chocolate chewy candies saying it'll build strong bones, people love to hear news like that, and that'll sell the product. So the FDA's relationship with the food companies is a lot less cozy than it is with the drug companies, but the, the business of the FDA approving health claims for different foods and nutrients and that sort of thing has resulted in this very perverse system of terrible foods, processed garbage, being fortified with nutrients and then making health claims about the benefits of consuming them. So again, bad, bad system for, for uh, public health. What I would like to see happen with labels, and I said this in my book, I think that food labels should be really simple. Okay, so you can have pictures of the food, that's fine. You can call the food something jazzy. Um, you can list the ingredients, and there would be some rules about that, so you don't get to have nine kinds of sugar so that sugar doesn't look like the first ingredient. Um, and no health claims. Now you can make claims like convenient, easy to make, kids love it, tastes great, but none of this business of eat this cereal and you're going to, you're, it improves cognitive health because it's fortified with, <laughs> with some vitamin, you know, some of the crazy, and, the, and no more of this, you know, chew these chocolate candies and your bones will be stronger as a result. Um, doctors don't get any nutrition training in school, and, and they really don't get, they, they get a lot of good education about intervention. And we need for doctors to have this kind of training. I'll tell you what, if I, if I had something cataclysmic happen to me, you know, in a car accident, severe injuries, lots of broken bones, uh, or something of that nature, you know where you want to have that happen? Right here in the United States of America. We have phenomenal intervention. Um, so I can't say enough good things about that. And we do have some amazing technology that allows us to diagnose things like brain tumors. And you know, so, so I, I think we have to be careful we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But medical doctors really are not trained about the cause of disease, which is diet in many cases, and how to resolve it, which is diet. They're taught how to resolve biomarkers with drugs, essentially. So nobody dies of high cholesterol. People die of heart disease, and cholesterol is a marker for heart disease, but the doctor's not taught to change the diet 
to lower the cholesterol level and the risk of heart disease, the doctor is trained to give a statin and not even to have the discussion with the patient. Um, I think it's just not part of medical training right now. I think that part of the problem is that pharmaceutical companies have a tremendous influence over medical training. They start buying textbooks for medical students and of course the medical students look at doctors being entertained during their residency by the drug companies. That looks pretty enticing. They tend to follow along. Um, and then another problem is that in residency, you have doctors who have been in practice training doctors. Now, there are a lot of good things from this. If I were going to perform surgery, I would really like to be learning a lot about that from a doctor who performs surgery, okay, has been doing it for 20 years. But what happens is also a lot of bad ideas get passed down. There's a lot of institutional memory that gets passed down. It makes it really hard to insert something as, I hate to say it, as groundbreaking. Using Eating a healthy diet, isn't it sad we're sitting here having a conversation about that being a groundbreaking idea, people eating healthy food? But it's hard to insert something um, groundbreaking, like the idea of the use of food as medicine in a system where you've got generations of people being trained in the same way. So bad, good practices get passed down, but a lot of bad ones do too. And it's very hard to insert something new, particularly if it isn't drug or procedure related, because there's no sponsor, no financial sponsor. Well, you don't learn a lot of things in medical school, and most people who are good at their profession in the health, in all health professions, if you talk to good physical therapists, good psychologists, good psychiatrists, good pediatricians, good internal medicine docs, family practice docs, cardiologists, they will tell you that what they learned in school has benefit, but a lot of the most valuable things that they do for patients every day came after medical school. And so um, I guess, first of all, we need to change that. But the second thing is that we need to be building into the DNA of all health professionals. Uh, I call it the curiosity gene. You gotta be a lifelong learner in this profession. And we don't have enough of that going on. I find that um, uh, medical doctors often don't read the medical literature, openly admit it by the way, and they say they don't have time. And so I teach by analogy. I always tell people, how would you like to go to, have a, to a CPA to have your tax returns prepared? Because this is the time of year we're all thinking about that, right? And your CPA openly acknowledges he hasn't really been reading much about the tax code for the last 15 years. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to go out and prepare your tax return. I hope you don't end up in jail for tax evasion. But I mean, we, we don't tolerate this in any other field. I mean, even car mechanics right now, the cars, cars and technology in cars is, has changed so much that everybody who's working on today's cars has to be pretty, pretty good computer technologist just to do it. And we expect that when we drop our car off at the dealer that the people working on these cars have been upgraded. They've, you know, they're, they're trained in an entirely different way. And if you started the profession 30 years ago, you've had to get some additional training to hang on to your job. And we don't expect that in the medical profession and it's sad. I want to talk about insurance companies for a minute because they're the companies everybody loves to hate. And, and I don't like them much either for a lot of reasons. But having said that, one of the reasons why insurance companies have become so difficult to get along with is because of the over-prescribing habits of physicians. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. You're president of the XYZ insurance company and you have to deliver a return for your shareholders. You routinely are being asked to pay $100,000 for a drug treatment called Avastin for breast cancer patients by oncologists. And Avastin doesn't extend life by a single day for a breast cancer patient. The FDA actually took off the approval for Avastin for breast cancer treatment, but it doesn't make any difference because once a drug is approved, a doctor can use it in any way he or she sees fit. It's off-label prescribing, it goes on all the time. So everybody loves to hate the insurance companies, but they're being asked to pay out hundreds of billions of dollars every year for things that they know have no hope of ever helping anybody. So what it does is it squeezes the whole system. So a pediatrician who's being, being paid $20 for a visit that should cost $150, um, and, and by the way, pediatricians participate in this too, over prescribing antibiotics and all this sort of thing. So, so what you have is a big mess, and then everybody says, well, I can't fix it myself. And, and they're right, one person can't fix it. Um, I think the thing that can fix it is people just digging in their heels and refusing to go along to get along. I had a most striking experience a couple months ago that I'll share with you. So um, I have one of our members is working on withdrawing from psychiatric drugs, which is not easy to do. 
And uh, one of our business partners, Dr. Peter Bragan, has always said that for somebody to take this on, the individual needs to have a team. You need a prescriber, you need a, a family member or two, a couple friends, you know. So anyway, um, I agreed to be a help per, helper for this person. And um, she said uh, she's going to talk to her family doctor. Her psychiatrist was really hostile to the idea. So she talked to her family doctor, and he said he would be happy to help if he had a greater understanding of what this was all about and that sort of thing. So she gave him some articles to read and, um, and said, um, after you read this stuff, uh, according to Dr. Bregan, we should have a meeting of all the people that are going to be involved in helping me, including you. So he agreed to a meeting. We were there for an hour with this doctor, an hour. And um, at the end of the meeting, I talked to him, because I'm always looking for doctors to refer people to. And I said, you know, I want to thank you, first of all, for being so kind to this woman. Um, and, and also for taking an hour to do this. He works for a big um, uh, complex um, medical institution in Columbus. And uh, I said, it's kind of unusual. He goes, yeah, I know it's unusual. He said, uh, he said I got very dissatisfied with medicine a few years ago. And I just decided that I was either going to practice the way I want to or I was going to quit. So he said, I said to my boss, I'm going to be doing things a little bit differently. We're going to have to build differently, but, but I'm not going to do this anymore. I just refuse. And he said, I don't spend an hour with everybody all the time, but he said, I do arrange my schedule so that when I have to spend time with patients, I can, uh, and that sort of thing. And I've probably sent 20 people to this guy since that all happened because he's amazing. So I think that sometimes it's easy to just throw up your hands and say, helpless, I can't do anything. Um, and I understand that feeling, but then you have to quickly bounce back and say, I refuse to be helpless. I will absolutely find a way to do something that makes this better or works or whatever. One thing that I'm encouraged about is seeing the number of doctors that I'm in touch with who are leaving those large practices in order to do what they want to do because they want to put the fun back in medicine. You know, for all the things you and I are talking about in terms of the shortcomings in medicine and the death by medical treatment, I think the vast majority of people who go into medicine want to help people. And again, we're talking about the good apples being thrown into a bad barrel. And many of them are starting to say, this is not why I went into practice. I want to do something different, and I'm going to make that happen. So we have to keep, keep in mind we've, we can take our power back and do things about this. How this is all going to get figured out, I think that's an interesting discussion to have. Um, everybody's waiting for some federal plan to figure it out. There's not going to be any federal plan to figure it out. In fact, the best thing that can happen is when Congress is in such gridlock they can't get anything done because then they can't screw things up any more than they're already screwed up. And then, then you get the government shutdowns. And, and I always love this, the non-essential government employees don't come to work. Well, if they're non-essential, why don't we get rid of them? <laughs> We don't have any non-essential people at Wellness Forum Health, right? Everybody's essential or we don't keep them on the payroll. Who in their right mind keeps non-essential people on the payroll? But ha having said that, we're not going to have the government solve this problem for us. And this, this giving up saying somebody else is responsible, here's how it's going to get solved. It's going to get solved as more and more consumers jump on the bandwagon to take control of their health, to recognize that health is not a right, it's a privilege and you earn it. You earn it by taking care of yourself, by feeding yourself properly, by becoming educated, by asking questions, by becoming an informed medical consumer. That's our business. We specialize in informed medical decision making. You get the power back. By realizing that every time you pay for something, you, use your, you swipe your credit card or write a check, you are endorsing something. So when you go to the grocery store and you buy chicken breast that comes from one of these factory farms where they've used antibiotics and steroids and hormones, and the conditions are inhumane and the feces are polluting the local environment and the water. You know what you're doing? You're saying, this is okay with me. All right? It's okay to pollute the water. And it's so okay with me, I'm going to spend money on it. Um, when you agree to drugs and procedures without checking into it, uh, you're, you're saying, this whole system's all right by me. I'm going to, I'm going to be a part of it. I'm going to show up and participate. You know, so, so you start to realize the importance of all the money you spend and uh, what that means. And I feel, and I've given a lot of thought to this, you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called The Tipping Point, and it's, the, it's when, when something gathers enough steam that, that literally you see a shift. And I think the tipping point for healthcare is you get about 20 to 30 million people who really do what we're talking about in a major way. They basically say, 
I am not going to support food that, I, that, that is unsustainable. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to buy conventionally grown animal food anymore, ever. I am going to learn how to be an informed consumer. I'm dropping out of the system. This system is so precarious that if 20 to 30 million people drop out of it, it's going to collapse. And it can happen sooner rather than later. It just depends on how fast it takes us, uh, how fast we can gather that number of bodies and teach them what to do. Well, another area in which we have disastrous things happening is, is population screening. Okay, so, so the reason why you do population screening is one of two things. Either you're trying to reduce the death rate, the risk of dying from something, or you're trying to reduce the risk of a comorbidity. Now let's talk about a population screening tool that's incredibly effective, pap tests. In every area of the world where pap tests have become the norm, You've seen the cervical cancer death rate just plummet. Now we do too many of them, and we act on the results in, a, in an inappropriate way sometimes. But, but the bottom line is that absolutely, I don't, I don't know anybody in the medical profession who would, would disagree with the widespread use of pap testing. It should be done everywhere. OK, so let's take a look at another screening test for women, mammography. OK, so. In spite of the fact that the United States spends $8.3 billion a year on mammograms, the death rate from breast cancer hasn't changed. It's appeared to change because of the shortcomings of mammography, which is that they find small masses that are contained, ductal carcinoma in situ is an example, that 88% of the time will not become cancerous. And then we treat these people as if they have cancer, and these women have surgery, usually a lumpectomy, although increasingly uh, mastectomy. These women have lumpectomies. They are given radiation, sometimes chemotherapy, sometimes uh, hormonal blockade, uh, aromatase inhibitors, that sort of thing. And so these women would be alive five years later, which is the benchmark, if you did nothing to them. So they go into the survival pool and it makes it look like we're doing better. But if you look at the death rate from invasive breast cancer, it hasn't changed at all since we started <coughs> excuse me, spending all this money on mammograms. So the bottom line is it's a complete failure. And furthermore, because when you treat people who don't have cancer as if they do have cancer, there can't be any benefit. There can only be harm. So the estimate for mammograms is that for every woman you save, um, at least three women are going to be harmed by overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And some of the results of that harm are, for example, if you have radiation, it can increase your risk of heart disease. So how would you like to find out you now have heart disease, which resulted from treatment for a condition you never had? So if you had never been swept into the system, there would be nothing wrong with you today. Um, so I, I think in the case of, of uh, tests like mammograms or screening tools like mammograms, women should see this before they decide if they want to have a mammogram. Um, PSA testing is another one, and the situation here is even more despicable. I happen to be a personal friend of Dr. Richard Ablin. He's the researcher who discovered prostate-specific antigen. It's not a marker for cancer. He's been trying to tell that to people for a very, very long time. Um, PSA has no usefulness in early stage prostate cancer. In spite of that, uh, we have taken the prostates out of about a million men in America, many of whom are incontinent and impotent, and they really didn't have cancer at all. So PSA screening, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force first said it's inappropriate for men of all ages, and then with pressure from uh, the Congress, which was pressured by drug companies and, and um, the people who make the companies that make the tests, uh, modified it to say, talk to your doctor about risk, but, but it, nothing's changed. It's a useless test. Um, colonoscopy, people are shocked when I say this, but there is not a single randomized trial that's ever shown that colonoscopy reduces your risk of dying of colon cancer. And there are studies that show that for every 1,250 people who have a colonoscopy, you save one life and you kill somebody else because there are downsides to having colonoscopies too. Again, I think people should see this information before they get swept up in, into all of this diagnostic testing. Um, another downside of screening programs that I don't think we talk enough about is they're promoted as the thing that will save your life. So much so that people think that they can eat, drink, and be merry, have screening tests every year to see literally if they're still getting away with it, right? 
And then if, you're, if your mammogram's clear and your blood test was all right and all that kind of stuff, then you go back home and eat some cheeseburgers and french fries and sit on the couch and uh, see if you can get away with it for another year when you go back and be tested again. So there's a, a passivity uh, that results from over-reliance on these types of tests, many of which don't really yield the results that people are looking for. Do the reason why doctors push screening tests is they believe that they're effective. But I always caution people in the health profession against practicing faith-based medicine. Okay. Now, as a person who has very strong spiritual beliefs and a very strong belief in and relationship with God, I don't want that statement to be misconstrued. But having said that, um, I think that um, we should use science and outcomes-based science to guide our decisions. And so um, that's the biggest reason is doctors not thinking for themselves to look at these things and decide what they want to do. Now, I'm going to give you the other side of the story because I'm hard on doctors, as you can tell from this discussion. And, um, uh, so we have to look at the other side. Doctors are often uh, expected to practice given the community standards of practice. Uh, they risk being sued if a person declines a mammogram and later has breast cancer. That's a risk that they all face. And they often work in institutional settings. In fact, in fact most doctors today work in institutional settings where you really don't, don't get to make those kinds of choices. So the institutionalization of medicine has caused many doctors to go along because they don't really have a choice. Well, the risks of imaging, uh, many forms of imaging, are understated. So there's a good, there, there are good reasons to have an image. There are good reasons to visit doctors. You know, if I had a pain in my side and it didn't go away in a few days, it appeared to be getting worse, I think I'd want to go have it checked out. Um, but, but we are exposed to so much radiation, even dental x-rays. Um, when you have them every year or two are a bad idea. And the American Dental Association doesn't recommend that anymore. They even, they're so conservative about the organization, not the dentist, are so conservative about uh, x-rays that they say that when a patient um, goes to a specialist that the x-rays should be obtained from the referring dentist instead of having new x-rays done at the in order to avoid additional radiation. Um, obviously, this is more impactful with children than it is with adults, but um, you know, we started our discussion talking about the protein issue and, and nutrients, more is better. Um, the imaging has gotten to that place too. There's a time for imaging and it can be very, very valuable. But more is not better, less would be better, and being much more responsible about it. One of the reasons that this goes on, and this is something else that's not talked about enough, is the fact that there is a perception in healthcare that nobody's paying for it. There's no price consciousness at all. People are completely disconnected from paying for things. Now, they pay insurance premiums, but, but they don't put together the direct, like what it costs, all right? And, and if everybody had um, the ability to be a payer in a meaningful sort of way as a consumer, this would all start to change. You wouldn't see so much overuse of imaging or other things for that matter. So I'll tell you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I have a friend whose wife developed a gynecological problem and was recommended she have surgery and she decided this was the moment when these people decided they were going to listen to what I had to say about how to keep yourself healthy. So this doctor got very upset with her when she declined the surgery. And he said, well, how are you gonna know it works? They said, well, we found out about this through an MRI, so we're gonna go get an MRI and find out how we're doing in a few weeks. And the doctor laughed and said, well, I'm not gonna be a part of that. So these are intelligent, educated people. They figure, how hard can it be to get an MRI, right? So they go to the place where they got the MRI, walk in one day, and said, we wanna get an MRI. And they said, well, you're not on the list. Well, I guess you gotta be on a list, right? Well, they said, no, we're not on any list. Well, you have to get a doctor referral. Well, no, we don't. I mean, can't you just come in here and get an MRI? Well, this just seemed to befuddle the whole place. So she goes and gets a supervisor, and, and this, you know, people are just completely amazed. So my friend says, um, well, what do, what do you charge for an MRI? Nobody ever asked the question. They said, well, uh, we usually just bill insurance. And they said, well, we're going to pay for it, OK? Just cash money. So how much does it cost? Well, that took a long time. They came back and said it's about $2,200. They said, no, I don't think you understand. 
I'm going to give you cash from the wallet. They ended up paying $225 for an MRI. Nobody had, think about all the money in addition to the $2,200 for the MRI. Now you've got to go get a doctor visit to be referred someplace, and they got a bill. So, so the bottom line is we've made it so that nobody has any idea how much any of this costs. Nobody has a stake in reducing the cost necessarily, although everybody claims that they do. And so um, the overuse of everything is easy to do when nobody is actually paying the bill. You know, when, when you hire a plumber at your house, you're, you're going to ask a lot of questions about what it costs. And if it's something major, you'll probably get another quote, uh, maybe two, just to make sure before you spend like $4,000 on something, right? We don't do that in medicine because nobody's really paying the bill. I think that people should look at any published research with skepticism. Um, Dr. Karl Popper, no relation to me, uh, said many, many years ago that the way that people should approach looking at an idea, something new, new information, is try to prove it wrong. And if it survives that, all right, then you know you really have something. So the, the medical journals are so clogged with garbage right now that when I read something, even if it says what I have believed to be true for a long time based on my research. I assume it's wrong unless I can prove it right by really looking at things like study design, um, the conflicts of interest of the authors, and that sort of thing. Um, there's so much mischief. And let me, let me give you an example of how drug companies got um, psychiatric drugs approved. Um, there were several uh, psychiatric drugs that um, the trials were set up for 16 weeks. All right, so you decide on a study design. We're going to give um, um, double-blind, placebo-controlled. So we're going to give half the people one of these drugs, half the people a placebo. We're going to follow them for 16 weeks. Okay, so what happens, and this happened actually in the case of a very well-known brand name psychiatric drug, is that at eight weeks, the people taking the drug were clearly better off than the people taking the placebo. But things started to go south, and at 12 weeks, not so much, and by 16 weeks, the placebo people were actually a little bit better off. So the data that were submitted to the FDA showed a cutoff at eight weeks, which really should be a form of criminal behavior. It's fraud. And the FDA approved this drug on the basis of these kinds of flawed studies. So you, you have to dig deeper than just looking at one study and, and almost assume from the start, it sounds like being a negative person, but that might protect you a lot in the healthcare business. Assume that it's wrong unless you can prove it right. Oh, diabetes is probably equally as preventable as heart disease. You know, when Dr. Esselstyn says it doesn't need to exist and doesn't need to progress, type 2 diabetes is a function of westernization. I mean, look what's happened in China. There used to be no type 2 diabetes in China to speak of, and now there are hundreds of millions of diabetics in China. And in a country of a billion and a half people, they just don't have the resources to deal with this. But what happens is people eat the rich Western diet, and it puts weight on you. I mean, the calorie density in an average day of eating, if you're eating the standard American diet, is ridiculous. You can't not gain weight, for most people anyway. So people gain weight, being obese and overweight or obese is a major risk factor, factor for type 2 diabetes. Um, another contributing factor, people think it's all about carbohydrates and sugar. It's really fat, because fat not only puts fat on your body, and that influences the development of diabetes because fat cells are more insulin resistant than muscle cells, but also fat gets inside the cell. We call it intramyocellular fat. And that fat gums up the cellular machinery and makes those cells more insulin resistant too. And so you don't have to eat the standard American diet. You don't have to eat all that fat. The good part is that if you're a type 2 diabetic with carrying some extra pounds, if you adopt a whole foods, plant-based, low-fat diet within a really short period of time, the diabetes starts to go away as the weight comes off. In fact, the, the reduction, um, if you're an insulin-dependent type 2 diabetic, you've got to be in pretty close touch with your doctor because the reduction in your insulin needs can be pretty significant. You don't want to end up comatose on your bathroom floor. So it's completely preventable and in many cases reversible. You can put it into remission and as long as you behave, you won't have diabetic symptoms anymore. Well, the effectiveness of drugs and, and surgery on cardiovascular disease depends on who we're talking about. You know, one of the things that I think is true about most of what we do in medicine is that there are 
people who benefit from almost all of it. I mean, I can think of some things where nobody benefits, like bisphosphonate drugs for osteoporosis, but, but most things, you, there are people who really do benefit. You know, so a good, a good example would be if you have familial hypercholesterolemia, and no matter how well you eat and how lean you stay and how much exercise you do, your cholesterol is 350, that's a situation where statin drugs are genuinely helpful. Um, if you arrive at the hospital in the middle of a myocardial infarction, bypass surgery or angioplasty can save your life. So the problem is not that these things are not useful. The problem is that there's no money in it to speak of unless you can use these things on huge swaths of the population. So now what we're basically doing is we're saying to everybody who has high cholesterol, don't worry about it, we can give you drugs. Um, we're doing bypass surgery a half a million times a year instead of maybe 15 or 20,000 times a year. We're doing angioplasty on people who don't qualify. I mean, we had a very interesting discussion last night with Dr. Williams from the American College of Cardiology talking about um, if you knock out, uh, there, there are two very specific situations in which angioplasty is, de is definitely warranted. It saves lives. If you knock that out, plus the people who arrive at the hospital in the middle of their heart attack, most angioplasty we do is not warranted. So I think the key is we have to get to the place where, where there's judgment on behalf of the consumer and the, the healthcare provider to make sure that we're using these things in appropriate ways. And, that, and if we did that, the perception of modern medicine, which now I think is quite negative in many people's eyes for good reason, it's bloated, it's expensive, it's inappropriate, it's impersonal, it's all about the money, we hurt people. We would go back to a time when discoveries in medicine were exciting. The development of the antibiotic was one of the most the biggest game changers in healthcare in the history of the planet. And it's totally been by, perverted by the overprescribing of antibiotics. I want to get back to the place where we look at the advancements that we've had in medicine as truly great achievements instead of doing what you and I are doing here, which is complaining about the overuse of it all. So I'm here at the Real Truth About Health Conference for a lot of reasons. Um, one is I did this before and it was a wonderful experience. Um, and I, I always like being in front of engaged audiences. And so the people who come here that we get to interact with, and you saw this from the number of questions, we never in any session get to the end of the questions. And even afterwards, they were like going to shut the lights out in the room. We had to like go out in the hallway because there are so many questions. And so I think from being a, in the healthcare business, that's, this is like a healthcare provider's dream if you're interested in this. People who are really um, curious, curious about all this stuff and asking questions and, and that sort of thing, it's fun. It's really fun. On a bigger note, all right, we, and there's been a lot of discussion about this at this conference. And in this conversation that you and I are having, the educated consumer is the only way that this is ever going to change. And so when I'm looking at where I'm going to go speak, because I have far more invitations than I take, and the money doesn't have anything to do with it, thank God I don't have to worry about that so much anymore, so where am I going to go spend time? The things that interest me most are the things that give me access to the biggest audience. And I think you would find that that would be the case with all of us who are here. Not in a vain way, like I just want people to know who I am, but in a greater good way that we all know that the real truth about health is completely the opposite of what people are inundated with every single day. And so anything that gives us access to large numbers of people who we can then say, and I've said it a couple of times, you heard Dr. Esselstyn say it, many say it, your job now, all of you out there, is to take this message to other people, and that's how you grow this every year into a bigger and bigger phenomenon. And then at some point in time, the people who know better will overwhelm the people who don't, um, sheer force of numbers, and then you get that tipping point that we were talking about earlier. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm happy to be here, grateful to be here.